This is Nick Wright uh, with Zachary Fillingham, Managing Editor of GeopoliticalMonitor.com. And today we're going to be talking about the ongoing tension between the United States and Iran. And you can check out the article that we're going to be referencing on the website, GeopoliticalMonitor.com. It's entitled, Backgrounder, Iran's Military Strategy in the Persian Gulf. So Zach, tell us a bit about what's been happening between the United States and Iran in and around the Persian Gulf. All right. So um, we've seen, okay, so just to differentiate, we did a podcast before on the tensions between the United States and Iran. This one, we're going to focus more on the, the military dimensions of a potential conflict. And the last one is more about the sort of political and diplomatic ramifications of a potential conflict. So um, as we've seen the last week or so, um, there have been several escalations. Um, there has been, I mean, basically a chain of escalations starting from, uh, I, I can't recall exactly what had happened before the last podcast, but some recent events include the shooting down of an unmanned drone by the Iranians, uh, President Trump um, now famously saying that he pulled back uh, an, uh, an American strike that was already in the air. Uh, when he learned that uh, 150 Iranians were would probably die as a result, he said it was disproportionate. And um, most recently, uh, an Iranian tanker was seized by by the British, um, uh, and they accused the Iranians of trying to sell that oil in breach of sanctions to the Syrians. So, so basically, we've seen a ramping up of the sort of diplomatic um, standoff between the United States and Iran. And does the United States have anything to fear in this conflict? What what are the potential ramifications from the U.S. perspective? Okay, so if if we actually did uh, move to a hot conflict where the two militaries were directly um, uh, fighting each other, so like obviously the U.S. military is su- superior to the Iranian military by just about every qualitative and quantitative measure um, to give a sense of just how asymmetric this is. The Iranians spend about 13 billion on defense uh, in, in 2018 compared to the Americans, uh, roughly 650 billion. Obviously, that's a huge gap. Um, but they're like, it's not so um, cut and dry of a conflict because there are sort of many nuances in this particular uh, uh, contingency that, that might actually produce more of a uh, a damaging conflict that that many might, would otherwise predict. So, uh, when you think about the tactical demands of the U.S. military, um, it's trying to plan for conflicts, for potential military contingencies all around the world, uh, different terrains, different climates, uh, different opponents. Right. So you have a huge, uh, like a vast plan that that makes it hard to sort of hone in on who you're going to fight. You don't know who your opponent's going to be. You don't know where that's going to be. Um, And now compare that to a country like Iran. And now not just Iran, lots of countries, lots of middle powers are like this. They're able to focus, to laser focus their tactical planning onto one specific opponent. And in the case of Iran and lots of other countries, one that comes to mind is China, um, they can design their whole tactical um, mindset around the potential of a fight, against, not only against the United States, but also it would be a fight in and around Iran. So they know, what they know what's coming and they know um, how to plan for it. And this, this plan is, is all about anti-access area denial. It's trying to push the, the U.S. Navy um, away from the, the waters surrounding uh, Iran, and um, it's all <clears throat> trying to make make uh, take advantage of Iran's geographical condition and the fact that it's so close to uh, the Strait of Hormuz, for example, which is a key energy supply choke point uh, where about one third of the world's energy supply moves through. So, despite the size and spending differential, what you're saying is that Iran uh, could put up uh, a fight against the United States. In and around the Persian uh, Gulf, not not so much in not not so much in the sense that <clears throat> Iran could hope to defeat the United States. I don't think that even the most optimistic and sort of radical voices, even within Iran, would would say that. But um, they, I, I, I think they, it's possible that they would be able to 
to achieve their goal. I think their goal is not to defeat the U.S. military head on. It's to create as high of a cost as possible for the U.S. administration and either deter deter war in the first place or if if war breaks out to make sure that that war is as short as possible. So this plan is based around or this goal is based around the fact that uh, the Iranian authorities, they know I mean, they're well aware of the, for example, the public support, the like the, the political situation in the United States. Right. They know that the public support for a war would be extremely fickle in this current context, um, <clears throat> in the post Iraq, post Afghanistan context. Um, and uh, so so by taking down high value military targets, uh, by causing havoc in regional theaters like Yemen, Syria and Iraq, and by targeting tanker traffic moving out of the Persian Gulf, uh, Iran could could basically focus its efforts on undercutting support, political support at war uh, for the war at home in the United States um, and among its allies, if if it had any going into this war. So, so more specifically, <clears throat> what are some of the things that Iran might do to uh, cause that sort of damage? Well, you could like, I mean, for example, um, <clears throat> Like Iran has proxies throughout the region, so it would be relatively easy for Iran to target U.S. Um, military personnel or um, contractors or diplomatic staff in places like Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, uh, Iraq. Like, for example, the, the troops that remain in Syria right now um, with the, uh, the Kurdish, the Syrian Kurds, um, they're, they're not well protected. They're... <clears throat> very susceptible for attack or susceptible to attack by Iranian proxies in Syria. Um, uh, stuff like that. For example, mining the, the Persian Gulf, you could uh, like the geography of the Strait of Hormoz is such that you can essentially block it off. It's such a choke point that you don't it doesn't take much in terms of either mines or missiles uh, to, to stop traffic through the Strait of Hormuz. And that would obviously have a huge um, uh, impact on global energy markets, global economy, et cetera. So, so basically like boiling this all down, it comes down to the, like, the classic uh, guerrilla warfare paradigm of asymmet asymmetry between you know, a powerful and a weak state. And, um, and usually history shows whether or not this kind of strategy works um, like in Vietnam, or whether it doesn't work, like in Desert Storm, usually boils down to the actual political unity of the opposing side, the weak side. And um, in this case, we don't really have much reason to believe that um, they, the Iranians would just sort of fold. So, so it would probably be um, uh, a real war, a hot war. And internally in Iran, uh, is there that sort of domestic unity uh, in opposition to the United States or are there factions that it's splinter? It's always hard. It's hard to say because, you know, we had the green movement in the early days of the Obama administration where you had a, a, a pan, a pan Iranian protest movement against the regime. Obviously, there's a huge amount of opposition to the regime that exists in Iran um, in uh in, in the case of the, the Green Movement, it was eventually crushed by the uh, Revolutionary Guards. And um, so, so obviously there's a lot of, there's a, a, you know, opposition to the regime exists within Iran. However, when you, when you have these kind of war situations, um, even now with the United States having pulled out of the deal and ramping up economic pressure again, um, usually it has the effect of rallying the population uh, around the national cause, because uh, like there's a handy villain for the Iranian regime here in in the United States. They they appear to be the aggressor in the eyes of many Iranians. So so some of that legitimate opposition is undercut by the fact that people will naturally start to rally around the flag in these types of situations. Uh, and how much does that play into American strategy? Uh, do you think the fact that? if there's a quarrel between the U.S. and Iran, that that has a tendency to uh, solidify uh, uh, Iranian political support in opposition to the U.S.? I don't think it's ever been seriously 
considered. I mean, like, there's two schools of thought, uh, like long, long-standing schools of thought in U.S. foreign policy towards Iran. Uh, the Trump administration policy we see now is kind of the ascendance of the um, the neocon, you know, um, the uh, John Bolton wing of U.S. foreign policy, the new American century wing of foreign policy thinking, where, you know, if you bomb it, they will come. The sort of the political opposition will rise up and you'll have um, you'll have partners to deal with on the ground. So like uh, like, you know, you would think that this kind of thinking has been nullified by the experience of Iraq. Uh, obviously, we saw that things didn't work that way uh, with Iraq, and it didn't work that way in Afghanistan. There's no sort of there's no groundswell of democratic um, support for the Americans, uh, and there, and and more importantly, there's no credible partners that you can work with on the ground. Um, so the the rise of the Obama wing of foreign policy thinking was was more hands off to to say you know. Um, adopt a more <clears throat> sort of balanced approach towards the Middle East where you're not so directly involved uh, in the workings of these these uh, these states and their rivalries, right? Like, like, for example, you're not necessarily taking a side in the Saudi Arabia-Iran rivalry, um, sort of hands off, and then sort of let, let your own democratic um, success story and your own soft power as the United States kind of indirectly affect the pro-democratic elements of the country. And then hopefully, you know, by having a less involved strategy, you'll actually bring about democratic change. Um, so those are the two sort of mindsets on it. I don't think that my own personal opinion is that I don't think that, um, I mean, I don't think if the Americans bomb carpet bomb Iran, I don't think that they're going to have anyone to work with on the ground. So you're either looking at like uh, the possibility of, of an invasion, which is sort of which is just impossible, like the amount of troops it would take, the terrain, like everything about it, the political will is just fundamentally impossible. Um, so you're basically looking at just just wreaking sort of devastation on Iran, on Iran and like that is what you can hope to achieve. And the, basically, and, and Iran exacting its own cost, as we've been talking about. And, and there's, there's a- Is it fair to say that to Donald say, Trump's influence would be to um, restrain that sort of approach or be reluctant to uh, engage militarily the way we might've seen in previous administrations? Well, you'd assume so, right? I mean, like uh, Trump was supposed to be the force for isolation in the US foreign policy complex, so. Um, I mean, at the ascendance of Donald Trump, I think it would be quite a reach to predict that uh, the U.S. would be engaging in an armed conflict with Iran because he was he was the one that was supposed to to sort of end this Middle Eastern adventurism. And, and that is ultimately why I think that uh, I hope that it's not going to happen, because I, I, I have a feeling that this is a lot of posturing, like even the fact he called back. He called back the planes in midair. I mean, like, it's a little bit of a Hollywood moment, right? Like, it's like, oh, we were at the brink, but, you know, like, these are the these are the stakes. You better come to the negotiation table, um, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that um, it will come to that because I think that there, there are way too many sort of recent historical examples of the fallacy of that kind of policy uh, in terms of, like, it costs more money and more more blood than what you ever get back for it. Um, especially with Iran, with what we're talking about, the fact that it can seriously disrupt um, like like energy markets and global economy and, and make you look like a like politically make you look like an idiot pretty quickly. Right. Like, for example. OK, so and you, you should check out the uh, check out the article on the website because we go through all of the um, uh, it's actually an out of house author. Um, uh, check out his work. It's really good. Alessandro. Uh, Good Gagiandis. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it's a very good article. He goes through all the technical details of some of the stuff I'm about to mention. And again, uh, that's the backgrounder, through... Iran's military strategy in the Persian Gulf at geopoliticalmonitor.com. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really good. So basically, um, just, just to like get a bit specific on some of the things that Iran could do in the event of a, of a military conflict, 
that could exact a cost on the U.S. military. So um, Iran has a, a relatively advanced submarine fleet with uh, three different classes of sub. Uh, one in particular is the Russian-made Kilo class, which is um, no slouch. It's very silent, diesel powered, and it, it could uh, represent a credible threat to the U.S. Navy operating in and around Iran. It has unmanned submersibles, uh, basically drones of the sea that it can, it can um, load up with mines. It can use them as a threat to military and commercial shipping. And it can also be used to deploy special forces. Um, special forces is another, uh, another field where Iran is usually singled out as, being, uh, as having a, a very advanced special pro forces program. Naval mines, um, uh, Iran has a vast arsenal of naval mines, including smart mines. Uh, these, these lay at the bottom of the seabed until a passing ship is detected. They come up and then they explode. They're very hard to clear. Um, by one estimate, uh, the Iranians have over 3,000 of these mines. Uh, Iran's surface-to-surface -surface missile program is extremely uh, advanced. In fact, this is one of the reasons why the Trump administration tore up the nuclear deal in the first place. It decried the fact that uh, the Obama administration did not include Iran's missile program in the, in the original agreement. Also, it assumes that they could have, but whatever. Um, so the technical details of all the different missiles, all the different classes can be found, again, in the article. But uh, these missiles can be used to target U.S. ships uh, and, US, and U.S. forces in the region, particularly in Iraq, which is nearby, um, and within range of some highly accurate missiles. Um, and also, more importantly, more dangerously, Iran is also said to have um, hypersonic car uh, carrier killer missiles which would um, theoretically pose a threat to U.S. carriers operating in the region. Um, obviously, these have never been, <clears throat> in, in the case of Iran and, and elsewhere, such as China or Russia, these, these types of missiles have never been fielded in a combat situation. We know that in theory, they could pose a sort of terminal threat to a U.S. carrier group, but we've never seen it happen. Um, you, obviously, you could imagine what kind of... Uh, political and propaganda impact something like that would have, even if a carrier was disabled by one of these missiles. Um, they also have uh, fast attack swarm boats. So basically, even though the Iranian Navy, the official one and the Revolutionary Guard one, they're both kind of not very good. So in, in a qualitative sense. So to make up for that shortcoming, they've basically built a huge amount of motorboats with guns on them. And uh, they will use these boats to sort of swarm the more advanced uh, American ships and, in theory, uh, disable them, sink them. Um, interestingly enough, this has kind of been a strategy that's been out there for a while now. If you want, Google the uh, Millennium Challenge 2002 War Games, uh, which is a sort of classic example of a U.S. war game where the team using these sort of asymmetric combat strat uh, tactics came out on top. Um, and so, yeah, so sorry. Uh, Iran also has a highly advanced cyber attack capacity. Uh, it could be used to target the U.S. government, military command, major U.S. companies, and um, <clears throat> various experts and uh, think tanks have noted that these, these sort of cyber attack cells seem to be preparing for... Um, an attack or a counterattack in, in recent weeks and months. And finally, they also, Iran also finally has the S-300 anti-air batteries that they, they, they purchased from Russia after a lot of diplomatic um, scandal. Uh, the, the deal went through after the nuclear deal, the, the Obama era nuclear deal was signed. And um, although Iran does not have a lot of these batteries, um, they def the batteries that they do have definitely represent a credible threat to U.S. air power. And they would probably be one of the first targets of a, a first strike by the Americans. So clearly Iran has military capacity and a military plan, uh, and that could impact the calculus that the United States uses when deciding how to proceed. Uh, but what's likely yeah. to happen in the short term? What will come of these uh, skirmishes that we've been seeing in recent weeks? 
I think that it's in, absolutely impossible to forecast what specifically could happen, but we do know that um, we're seeing a ramping up of hostilities between two sides. And um, I mean, like the shooting down of an unmanned drone, that's like, that's a considerable provocation, right? Like the Iranians um, are not sort of being cowed by the maximum pressure strategy. And uh, I think it, it's worth bearing in mind that these two governments, they don't even have direct communications. There's no official um, diplomatic relations or, or direct red, you know, red line between the two governments. So in situations like this, uh, it's very easy for miscalculations to sort of send um, one, one uh, what would otherwise be a small incident sort of spiraling out of control and into a wider conflict. So it's a very dangerous situation. And it's also a situation where both sides seem to be maneuvering uh, such that they do not want to be blamed. So maybe this is a positive in all this. Neither side wants to be blamed for starting the fight. Um, I think that that's pretty apparent. Um, Particularly the Trump administration, I'm sure they've seen the polls um, that say basically an overwhelming majority of people do not uh, do not want a war in Iran. However, if Iran were to um, attack U.S. Uh, personnel or targets first, uh, that the support you know grows exponentially to about three quarters. I think where they would. Um, they would approve of a military retaliation. So um, basically how the conflict starts is, is important um, and it will sort of affect the subsequent events. Interesting. Well, it's definitely a topic we'll continue to cover on the website at geopoliticalmonitor.com. Uh, Zach, is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Nope, that's about it. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. And I encourage everyone to check out the article because um, it goes way more in depth with uh, about what what Iran actually has. And again, that's Backgrounder, Iran's military strategy in the Persian Gulf. So thank you, everyone, for listening and talk to you next time.